sister gets into a Jeep. Yeah. And drives through the motherfucking desert over landmines. You think Bob Hope was out here with the USO? Come on! Bob Hope ain't got shit on Josephine fucking Baker over here. And his tits were gross. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Hilf History I'd Like to Fuck with Don Brody. I'm Don Brody. And you are welcome in the den. That's the Deluxe Edition Network. To find your next favorite podcast in the den, follow the links in our show notes or go to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. No, this episode has it all. Okay, we got sex, spying, war, and bare naked. (laughs) <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Josephine Baker. Now, oh, this woman had a full, incredible life with multiple fuckable chapters, but too many, she is largely unknown. Okay, so before uh, we all jump in the sack with her, here is just the quick and dirty the info, okay, that you should know going in. Um, she grew up poor in the Jim Crow South. She starts out on Broadway during the Jazz Age and then moves to Paris in the 1920s, okay? Within a couple of years, she is among the richest, most famous figures in the world. I mean, Picasso painted her and Hemingway called her the most sensational woman he'd ever met. I mean, right? But she's also... Buried at the Pantheon in Paris, a place reserved for only the most heroic, iconic figures in French history. And I mean, she's alongside Victor Hugo and Mary Curie. Guys, (laughs) in the dance that first made her famous, she was totally nude except for a banana skirt. Okay, so how does an American-born black topless dancer get buried a French hero? Oh, you're about to find out. <laughs> and we are so lucky to be joined by Katie Hearn Church, the fantastic host of the Queen's podcast. She and her co host, Nathan Foster, also fuck history, <laughs> specifically the tales of women, queens, from Anne Boleyn to Tina Turner. And she's funny, and she's smart, and she loves a cocktail in the early afternoon. (laughs) Swoon. (laughs) And as we record, we are both nestled in our respective offices. She's in Illinois, I'm in California. And you, (laughs) wherever you are, (laughs) have just made this a three-way. Let's get started. Can you see me? I keep like, I, it's like my ass is on fire. I keep shifting in my chair. I'm clutch. I'm two fisting it. I've got hot tea in one hand. I got cold whiskey in the other because I'm so fucking excited. And I'm sitting here looking at the oh gorgeous God. face of Katie Hearn Church of the Queen's podcast. Sister, we're doing it. Don, I am so excited. I have been loving your show ever since it came out as someone who thinks, you know, I I love history even when it is dull and boring because <laughs> I'm that's just the way. But like I love it feels like it's kind of a recent a recent thing that people are realizing history doesn't have to be just World War II and uh, dudes reenacting the Civil War. You know, like yeah. history can be sexy. History can be messy. History can be interesting. And so when I first saw like the name of your show, maybe like a year ago or something, I was like, oh, like I just heard the title. I was like, <laughs> I get it. I didn't even, I was like, I get it. And so I'm so excited to be here. I've been such a fan of yours. Oh, that fills my sales, man. And it is mutual because, I mean, if you put our two podcast squares together, which I think some of our listeners probably (laughs) probably do, yours is the butt of a Roman Greek goddess statue, sort of censored, right? Just Mm -hmm, this butt. mm -hmm. And it's, 
you guys, you and Nathan have lifted up these untold stories of like phenomenal women throughout history. You go from Queen Elizabeth yes. to Tina Turner. No queen is safe. And you drink while you do it. I mean, yeah. I, Here's a bunch of nerds that are also into it. <laughs> Let's get it going. Your podcast is so fucking great. You and Nathan have been Thank doing you. it for a minute. Can you, yeah. f- for people who may not be familiar, tell us why yeah. you and Nathan decided that of, of all of the fuckable history that nerds like us get into, y'all selected queens. Sure. So I am... I've been a history nerd my entire life, and I've also known Nathan my entire life, just about. We met at age 11 doing a play about George Washington. Um, Hot. He, play, he played George Hancock. I played a cheerleader, because in this play, <laughs> for 11-year-olds, <laughs> George Washington had cheerleaders. Love and, it. Yeah, and we've just been friends since, and we've always just been a little bit on the dramatic side. And um, yeah, when in 2017, which is when our show started, I just got into podcast. And I'm not, I will give credit where credit is due. Have you ever listened to the History Chicks? Yes. Love they the were History my favorite podcast. They were my favorite podcast at the time. And I was like, oh, I want to do this. But what if we made dick jokes and got drunk? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, who would want to do this with me? And I reached out to Nathan and he was like that. Yeah, that sounds yeah. great. And yeah, and yeah, we've been doing it started with just him, me and him hunched over a single microphone with just a shaker of a disgusting cocktail. Nice. And literally my goal was, um, hey, if I can make a handful of friends, how mm. cool would that be? Mm. And then. And then we started the Patreon and I was like, hey, if we could make $30 a month, that would cover all of our costs. Yeah. And now I think we have 800 amazing Patreon subscribers. Oh, and sister. It turns out there's a lot of nerds out there that want to mm. hear about women in history. And we love all of them. Oh, my God. And let me lift you up, too, because your podcast is great. Your banter is great. Your history is solid and well-researched. And you were also dope because you, like, reached out to me in this just, like, solidarity, like, girl, we are in the same circles, girl, let's dance. And and have come together with, like, similarly minded just, like, gals in podcasting who are just hustling and making it work. And I think that is pure sex. It is... (laughs) You know, it's just so great. It's an example of of uh, how folks with similar interests lean yeah. into the idea of community instead of being like, well, one of these bitches has to die. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, how hot. I'll sit and talk to Katie. We'll talk about history. Really, any fucking thing that we want to talk about is going to be great. And when I reached out to you, we were talking about some possible subjects. We mutually agreed on Josephine Baker. My see, heart. we're both, you can't see us. I don't have, our hands are uh. over our hearts. We're flexing. We're gasping. What was it about Josephine Baker and her story that first caught your eye? I, I can't remember what first brought me to her, but I do remember that like, once I first started reading about her, do you know how sometimes I love everything that we've done on our show, but some topics yeah. just stick with you. Yeah. From the moment I started researching her, I felt like, oh, I know this woman. Mm. And I love her because she's not perfect. There's so many people that we discuss that obviously their team has gone through and done like a scrub campaign to make this person look like right. she's not perfect. She's messy and she's vulnerable. And she wasn't always on top of the world. But when she was, she was generous and she had a huge heart. And I just, oh, I just love Josephine Baker. Yeah, it's gush is right. Like your head gets thrown back, arms over chest, Uh, and you just are like, I can't stand how much I love her. Similar. Now, I came to Josephine Baker uh, completely ignorantly 
this is going to sound so pretentious, but I <laughs> speak some French. I, I swear okay. to God, I'm not going to slaughter okay. French during un peu foncé. And I'm in, in sort of like, I have flabby, I have a flabby body, but I keep working out. Like I'm not great at <laughs> French, but I'm going to take my fucking Duolingo every day because flabby French is better than no French. Right. And, we, um, we, and <laughs> one of the things that this solid nerd does to learn French is I listen to history podcasts in French and oh. because it's the smashing of all the things and they, it's not, don't get too impressed. They, they translate a lot of it into English and there's often an English person, you know, English language sort of getting you from yeah. piece to piece. But the idea is that you pick a subject that you're genuinely interested in so that while you're listening to it in French, your brain is sort of sorting it out and man, Picking up words. Right. They did this like 10 part history series on Josephine Baker in English and French. And I was just uh, in knots and dying. And how could I not know who this woman is? And how have I never how is she never registered to me before? Ah. And so I threw her on my hilf list because I'm like, I got to get this slut naked. Right. Mm-hmm. Then you oh, and, I and, she, and them, she would be like, gladly. She's like, oh, you want me to get naked? Let's yeah. do it. <laughs> She'd be like, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to quick get dressed. <laughs> and then yeah. poof, there oh, I, I was am. Already naked. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, so when I brought her up, when you and I started talking, you were like, yeah, I just did the episode on her. And naturally I got myself a cocktail, settled in and listened to the two parter that you and Nathan did. And mm-hmm. I don't, I I'm sure you recall that in your research, which is fantastic. And you focus on what is often focused on in her life, which is her her childhood, her rise to stardom and her work in the war and then her life afterwards. Her life is sort of mm-hmm. beautifully broken up into these like incredible chapters. Mm-hmm. You know, this rise to European stardom from an impoverished childhood in the United States, becoming a secret agent for free France and the <laughs> French resistance during World War II. And then after the war, she raises 12 adopted kids in this rainbow tribe and it, it, which I is kind of prob- a little problematic because she didn't tell her partner that she was bringing home more kids. Yeah, but. it's <laughs> incredible. Yeah, complicated, sticky, problematic. <laughs> but what your podcast had done, and what almost any recreation of her life had done prior to 2020, was just sort of give the loose what we know about her spy years. We knew mm-hmm. she was a spy. She was honored as a spy. The French admitted she was a spy. And we, we have a co- handful of colorful stories about her pinning things into her underwear and writing in secret, you know, ink and mm-hmm. stuff like that, which is sexy enough. And you mention in your podcast that there's a new book that came out in yeah. 2020 called Agent Josephine that it, as soon as those secret records were released, which every couple decades they uh, decide a little bit more can come out. And the French are a little bit more transparent than some other secret agencies in the world. And this fucking thing, I, I talk to my listeners sometimes about my books, man. Probably the other like tome that was this fucking intense was my Aleister Crowley biography. And that thing sucked because he sucked. This thing is as bad. That you know, was an interesting listen. <laughs> oh, that fucking guy, right? That fucking guy. And this thing was almost as long, but just a joy. It's just page after page of I can't believe how fucking nuts this is and how in depth her spying Really, I went. bought that book. I bought the book, but I didn't get to finish it. So <laughs> I can't wait to learn something new about Josephine Baker from you today. My historical crush. Oh, my God. I'm so <laughs> excited. And for our listeners, man, if you haven't already, this is a perfect pairing for your podcast because you and Nathan do her childhood, her coming up in St. Louis, her rise to stardom, and you cover a lot of her Rainbow Tribe family Mm -hmm. post-war years. And so what we're going to be fucking primarily today are the sources from this book and her war years and her time in espionage. Oh, (laughs) my Lord. (laughs) To uh, whet our palate and panties, whatever needs whetting, a story to set the mood. Come with me to the fall of 1940 
in France, okay? It's the okay. worst case scenario for everybody, but especially our friend Josephine, okay? The fucking Hitler is in Paris. We watch these ugly fucking tanks and all of his stupid mm. fucking swastikas are in the Arc de Triomphe, fucking Poland. We got Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, they're fucking done. If you've listened to the Nazi killing episode that I did about them gals who, who seduce Nazis in the woods, they just got bulldozed. Their whole country's getting fucked. I mean, it's the uh, worst, right? It's a, it's not, it's not a chill time. No, very unchill. It, it's been not chill for a minute because our girl Josephine had already been working as a spy prior to the official, quote unquote, outbreak of World War II. And just like a bunch of other folks, she had to get the fuck out of Dodge when Paris mm -hmm. was occupied in her beautiful car. And she, it's smoking fucking roads are, are destroyed. And because she's Josephine, she's picking up fucking Jews and animals and people she finds along the way. And she's dodging bullets. It's nuts. Yes. But she finally gets to... Could be worse places to go. She gets to her castle. Her chateau. Her chateau de Melon, which is not far <laughs> from Bordeaux. It's beautiful and not a bad place to lay low, but it's still not exactly out of the fucking worst of it because it's still in France, right? And, and she's got more than just the people she's picked up along the way. Sister has guns and secret documents and spies in her house. Passports. Yeah. And they're just like, fuck. Oh my God. Fuck. And all of a sudden, Katie, a huge panicked knock on the bang, 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 bang on the oh door. No. Yeah. And everybody's sphincter. Fuck. 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 Right? Yes. Oh my gosh. And they, and the servants, Go down to hello because we have to, it, it, among other things, we got to be so cool. We're not even scared because why oh, would we be bonjour. scared? There's nothing. Bonjour. C'est très bien. And, she, and it's this kid, this like 20 year old guy, and he's sweaty and he's frantic and he's nervous and he's holding a briefcase, Katie. And he's like, I need to <laughs> fucking talk to Josephine, only Josephine. And I need to talk to her right now. Mental, all right? <laughs> and the servant's like, I'm sorry, no, you know, she's so That's busy and so nice. famous. We're not really seeing any fans right now. And he's like, I'm not a fucking <laughs> fan and I need to see her. And and they're, I, he's so frantic, of course, very suspicious. You know, they're trying to trap spies and the best way to trap a spy is to pretend you're got spy stuff, you know? So she's acting very <laughs> cool and very normal, but eventually they bring him in. And he is, again, with this briefcase, this is very important documents that I have to give you because I know you're a spy, and I know that because Father Dillard told me. Who is Papa Dillard? He's a saintly fella. He's on the good guy's side. He's very involved in the espionage. But guess what? Everybody knows that. So it's not like you, it'd be like me coming up to be like, as you know, I'm a socialist because Bernie Sanders sent me. Be like, well, <laughs> you know, I don't know, I don't know, you know, if that's the most convincing, you just, you name job. And they're like, yeah, we really don't want to get involved. And they, and, and he leaves. Goodbye. And this poor kid stumbles with his briefcase down the door and Josephine and, and her fellow spy watch him leave. And they're thinking, fuck, we nailed that. Nice try, Gestapo. They got nothing <laughs> on us. And then as they're standing there thinking about it, they're like, wait a second. Ah, wait, if that was a spy sent by the Gestapo to see if we're spies, we could still get in trouble because we didn't turn in the spy. Like t test two is, do we turn him in and say, Hey, by the way, we know about a spy. Fuck we got. It. And then as soon as they think about that and they're like, well, we're not going to turn a guy in. Cause what if he is real? Really is on our side. The mental gymnastics of being a spy. I could never do it. I could never. I could never. I, it's why I, I don't lie. I smoke too much dope. I can't keep track of this kind of <laughs> stuff. But these guys are like, Oh, we fucked that up because we need to keep him. We need to scrutinize this guy more. We should have spent more time figuring out if he was real or not instead of being so worried he was getting us. So they get the local sheriff, who's a good guy, who's like on their side. And they're like, we got to go find this kid. He, he's probably at the day scour. They get to the train station. They spot him at the train station and he spots them. And he, of course, is immediately like, fuck, they're bad guys. They're bad spies. They've got a sheriff. And he takes off running. Okay. They take off running after him, capture him, get him. And they're like, okay, we got to talk to you. Was it? And they scrutinize and finally they get his name. It's clear. They've cleared him. Okay. We have some reasonable confidence that this guy's not working for the Gestapo. Phew. And then they're like, where are those documents? And he goes, funny story. When I saw you guys at the train station, I threw them under a table. So those not, very not important. Like, so 
They're just out there. So they're under out, a so table. It's like, ah, and they had like just calmed down. So they're like, no, no. So they get run haul ass back to the train station and lucky them, they're still there. The Nazis haven't found oh, the briefcase. Thank God. Thank God. Oh, and oh. They, I mean, and they go back to the chateau. I need a drink after that. I mean, cheers, right? <laughs> I tell this story at the get-go because I think that before we had details like that, even for me, it was easy to imagine Josephine as a passive spy. That she, I could, we could only contain what we had already heard, which is she slipped notes in her undies and she wrote a secret ink on her sheet music, which is again, fascinating enough, but it sounds like she's a mule, which is great. But she was more than a mule sister. The active role that she played in the espionage in which she participated, I think will be what will blow your hair back the most. Oh, I already like seriously, she's already my number one celebrity historical crush. So I can't wait to love her even more. I can't wait to find her even more fascinating. (laughs) By the time we meet Josephine at the age of 19, this is in 1925, sister's been married and divorced twice. She got married the first time at 13, the second time Mm -hmm. at 15. Her mom is unkind and resentful in part because she herself had a dream of performing and Josephine was her first child and, and... to her mind, she ruined that for her. Yeah. And she's gotten her ass to New York City, which is in the jazz era of the 20s and in the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And she gets into shuffle along against all odds by being gritty, by being tenacious, by just lying about her age, by just never giving up, right? And when she finally gets on stage, listeners, and shuffle along is a huge role. You know, it, it introduced to to the the collective consciousness a lot of incredible black artists. She's cast as a chorus girl, and she's a great dancer, and she's doing the thing. But what she does that makes her stand out is she's funny. Yeah, she clowns. She makes ridiculous faces. She's all elbows and knees. And the general feeling from the audience is, oh look, that chorus girl can't dance, doesn't know the choreography, isn't doing very well, and is a clown, kind of a buffoon. But then, like all brilliant clowns, it flips on its head, and you realize that she is the most coordinated, physically astute one on the stage, and that this clowning and this hilarity actually has within it a a superior performance style and and they're drawn to her, which puts her out of favor with some of the other chorus girls who are like, oh, cute. So you make stupid fucking faces and you don't do the dance right. And now you have my job. Fantastic, (laughs) right? But she's like, yeah, fuck yourself. Maybe you should have thought of it first. The chorus girls would hide her makeup Mm. and they would... um, like hide her costumes or throw it in the dumpster and she'd have to go dig her costumes out. Not a real sisterhood. No, no. But cause she knew, cause um, you know, she was maybe a little bit of a late developer. So she didn't have the curves the other girls had, but she knew that people were coming to see the funny girl, the funny girl. Totally. And and this was now it wasn't getting her leading roles, but it was consistently getting her a job and a job is really what she had originally come there for. Right. And then the big break, a a rich socialite American producer recognizes that this this phenomenon of American jazz in the 20s is an export. This is a product. The world will probably love this. They have connections in France and they cast Josephine to go to Paris to do La Revue Negra, which it doesn't take a French scholar to translate. It's the black people show. It's the review yeah. with blacks in it is the French yeah. translation. And it's more than just sort of a pantomime and a display of black bodies. She is in the banana skirt topless. And if you had heard of Josephine Baker prior to my friend Katie and I talking about her today, chances are <laughs> it's the banana you skirt. Know, the banana skirt. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And the thing is that this draws into our our historical nerdery, Katie, that that this book really illuminated, was the difference between American racism in the 20s and European racism in the 20s. And this was, of course, not obscured to Josephine. She was not unaware of these things. She's navigating beautifully within them. And it is Mm -hmm. that America's racism against black bodies was based in slavery. Surprise. That mm. that these were human beings that we had to justify psychologically as a society as being less than human, subhuman, so that we could subject them, right? Yeah. In France, they colonized Africa. But it would be the difference between this is something I own and therefore abuse, and this is something I own and put in a jeweled case. Neither is great, for autonomy and for equality. But I think we can all recognize if you're the subject of it, which one you'd pick if you had to pick one. Uh, For sure. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, um, it's a turd sandwich either way. Uh, Mm -hmm. Again, a scholarly term, but (laughs) you think that um, Josephine felt, cause I go back and forth. I'm like, I have no idea. Cause I am the whitest person to ever live. But like, <laughs> do you think when it came to that, um, her ancestry was kind of a trend at the time? Do you mm-hmm. think she felt like degraded or do you think she felt empowered? Like, yeah, I'm making a joke out of, uh, cause the banana dance was like this guy yeah. chasing her around with a net. Like he's trying to catch, and enslave her, and yeah. she's, like, outrunning him. Boy, you know, that's tough. That's such a good or question. Or could it be both? Or could it be both? Could she feel I both degraded both. and empowered? Or Okay. I or, think uh, it's both. I also wonder I mean, if maybe she was, like, I was catching rats as a five-year-old to eat. Word. Put me, put me in a banana skirt. Let me... Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, this is such a good question, Katie. And I think... I've, I've, I've pondered this before in various circumstances. And one of, one of the things that helps me answer the question, which of course is, uh, you know, how someone felt, which even if you're in a room with them, is difficult to determine, let alone if they've been, you know, dead for 40 dead years. Dead for... Yeah, before but, I was born. Um, but... I wonder, for example, when I think, especially with artists, because artists are representing themselves and they're often representing something bigger. So they're sort of in a unique position to ask that question. What are you what are you trying to say about me putting me in this skirt and in this role? How should I feel about doing this? Or what are you trying to say about black women? And how should I feel about like what you're doing to black women? That's like such a good question. And artists sort of uniquely have to handle that. I don't worry if my barista at Starbucks feels as if I'm treating her like just someone who gives me coffee. So you know what I mean? And I don't worry about my accountant thinking, oh, she's just thinking all I do is work with numbers all day. Do you know what I mean? So then at at a point, I think about it as a job. You're going to a job to make money. And if this is the job you're doing, then maybe you can Especially when you're making this quantities of money. Oh, she was making so much money. <laughs> but I suspect that that consciously or subconsciously did weigh on her. But then there's the extent of the fame and the celebration that even if you did feel demeaned and diminished because you're topless in a banana skirt playing a sort of racial stereotype, that the highest class of women in Paris are trying actively to look more like you. Begging you to come to their parties. Like. They are they are dar- trying to get darker mm-hmm. like you. Mm-hmm. They are wearing their hair like you. Yeah, th- if you are at my party, I am better. So it becomes probably very difficult to square a feeling that you're being diminished while you're being so lifted up. I suspect it was something of a mind fuck, man. And I'll tell you this, Katie, it probably wasn't made any clearer for her when at the peak of her stardom, Mm -hmm. okay, she is in movies. She's the first black female lead in a movie in 1927. Ever. She is in operas. She's doing more than just shaking her tits that she thinks to herself, aha, I'm a millionaire. Hemingway called me the most sensational woman he's ever seen. Mm -hmm. I bet I can walk back into New York City and be treated a little bit better than I was 10 years ago, right? So she goes to New York City in 1935 and no, it's like, fuck this place. The Cotton Club won't serve her. 
She can't get a hotel room. She's supposed to do a, a show there for a lot longer. She cuts her contract short because Racism. the ceiling is lower. The reviews use the N word. Oh the, the her fellow stars treat her like trash and call her trash. She can't be served a meal in a restaurant. And when she gets back to Paris in 1936, she renounces her citizenship. She becomes a legal citizen of France. She marries not just a rich French guy, but a Jewish rich (laughs) French guy. How do you like that? (sighs) Fucking Nazis. And she just keeps getting richer and more famous until, of course, the year 1939. Lands on everybody's. When the shit hits the fan. Mm. And like, I, I, I generally don't focus on the present because I find it unsexy compared to the past. Okay. But there is some familiarity in reading the pages of how it feels when a war is slowly starting. Right. And it wasn't mm. like World War II was a total shock because Josephine had performed in Berlin in 1926 (gasps) and had a fucking blast. You've seen cabaret, fucking Eliza and transsexuals and tits and booze. And it's Berlin in 1926. And when she goes back in 1928, it's not a blast. The brown shirts are circling. She was still selling out. She was still completely selling out her venues. But the brown shirts are sitting there... At the venue, and when people come up to walk in to see her, they intimidate her to leave. The demand was still there for her. It was Mm -hmm. just this subsect of people that ran the rest of the population. That is such a great point. It was not like there was a rejection of Josephine Baker among the populace. No, you're exactly right. And this is also part of what's brewing and how people can feel what is going on in Germany? What exactly the Nazi party has in mind? And as a result, you've got these two huge spy agencies that are churning out a ton of espionage in the years leading up to World War. And keep in mind, it wasn't that long before World War. It wasn't that long since World War I. Okay. Like that one was still in the, like a lot of the vets, the like war heroes of World War I are still yeah. hot. Okay. They're still look great. And they're still the toast of the town. This is not like the veterans that are coming in with the walking stick talking about the no. old war. It just fucking happened. World War I and World War II aren't separated by that many years. Like, and there's some, mm-mm. and there's distrust and there's lines and a lot of the lines are falling on the same side. Right. So in England, you've got their secret service is the SIS. And in France, mm-hmm. their secret service is called Le Deuxième Bureau, which is the second desk, it translates as, which is very hot, second desk. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to introduce you to a hot twat spy named Jacques mm. Abti. Jacques mm. Abti, blonde, coiffed, très France. And he's been told by the Deuxième Bureau, his spy agency, we want you to go recruit Josephine Baker to see if she'll become a spy for the French Secret Service. And he's like, I'm sorry, the gal, the the titties with the cheetah? Because she walks a cheetah on a diamond (laughs) leash through Paris, a cheetah that jumps into the orchestra pit. I'm just going to go out on a leash here, uh, uh, not a diamond one as a spy. Cheetah. Yeah. Chiquita gonna, the cheetah. Chiquita the cheetah on a diamond leash. Named after the bananas. Get the fuck out of here, Josephine, you hot twat. And, and Apti's like, I just kind of feel like maybe not spy material because who would be the modern day equivalent? Like if oh, someone was I'm to so go glad to- you asked. I'm so glad you asked because okay. I have been circling on that exact question. It's got to be Taylor Swift. I was thinking Miley Cyrus because she's a little bit more sexy. She is more sexy, but she's not as big. Ta- the difference okay. is Taylor Swift can. But would Taylor Swift put her neck out like that? And I don't know. Well, I'm not a I don't know about so quality. I guess I'm talking about star co- quality. Okay. What I think Taylor Swift has that Josephine has that would look similar, at least to a spy. So if you're a spy agency that is trying to get a very famous high profile person who can go anywhere, who can get into forbidden places without raising suspicion because they're invited girl. I mean, Taylor Swift at this point, 
yeah. is almost a bad example because she's too big. She's too she famous. could no longer go to a Saudi's secret party. But Beyonce gets paid enough to go to Saudi's secret parties. We all I know. I think Beyonce, yeah. Beyonce, Beyonce might be the it. best example because mm-hmm. these individuals are not sneaking anywhere. An old school spy mentality said a spy has to be basically invisible. They have to be able to mm-hmm. sneak like a ghost. They're there without being there. No one remembers them. No one knows who they are. And this is the absolute opposite, which is, of course, why it's a great tactic. Yeah. And so Jacques Apte is like, okay, you want me to go see if the d- cheetah lady is going to be a spy for, okay, I'll go to her sh- k- fucking castle and I'll ask her. <laughs> I'll go to and, her chateau. All yeah. right. Yeah. And he goes to her chateau and you may recall from your episode, you mentioned this moment. Do you remember how she uh, greets Jacques Apte when he arrives well, at her she's house? Feed- she's feeding her ducks when he gets there. She is. She comes out of the garden carrying a bucket of snails. Yes. She's got a bucket (laughs) of snails because she's feeding the snails to the ducks. And so he is like, oh, that's kind of dope. Like she's well, he she thinks it's he thinks it's her person. gardener at first. He yeah. thinks it's her gardener. <laughs> He's like, Hi, black lady. Where's the famous black lady who lives here? You know? And she's like, I'm the only black that's lady. Me. I do all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um and so he is like, okay. And, and when he presents her with the idea of working for the French resistance, she is immediately on board. She has Mm -hmm. no hesitation. And she says, France has given me life and I will give my life for France. She knows the stakes. It gives me chills. I know me too. (laughs) And let me tell you about her first missions because this is pre-war. Okay. So this is, Mm -hmm. this is where most of the espionage that we're doing now is like, so how bad is it going to be? Are they really, I mean, we kind of think they're going to invade people and who's going to be, and we kind of think we know who's going to be on whose side. But let's just see if we can use our great spy skills to do that. And there were two incredible missions, Katie, early in the war that changed the course of the war that Josephine is directly involved in. And the first one is answering the question of what do you suppose Mussolini's going to do? Italy has been telling the Western allies we hate Nazis and we're totally not going to do that. But there's a lot of evidence that Mussolini is actually very confidently friendly with Hitler. And we're just trying to get into this. And Josephine, in 1935, a few years before this, had been Mussolini's favorite gal. She went and performed in Italy all the time. He fucking loved her. And she took a public stance on his side In a civil war, it's too long Mm -hmm. to get into. It has to do with fucking Ethiopia. But she's his bud, and he trusts her, right? She didn't know. She didn't didn't know the whole thing about that other war. And and you didn't have the internet back then to, like, do, like... Hard to Google. (laughs) You shouldn't say Google. You know, like... She didn't actually get this stuff from Mussolini himself. But being besties with with Mussolini gets you into them parties, right? Yes. And she starts dancing with dude. And... She basically says, so what are your plans for the summer? And he's like, looks like we're going to be at war with the Germans. You know, we've been telling the West that we're on their side, but we're not. I mean, it's that easy. Yeah. And that's just one. The other one is Japan. And this one, Katie. So if you remember, I told you she goes back to New York for a hot minute and they treat her like shit, right? And it's her Japanese friend that gives her a place to say and like gives her solace. So Totally. And she, Miki, is... Not only Josephine's like Japanese buddy who gave her a place to stay in New York and saved her bacon when she was being horribly mistreated. But while she was in New York, Josephine snuck out. And by snuck out, I just mean she didn't make a big deal about it to feed the poor, which is what she's doing all the Mm -hmm. time. She drives her car to the poorest part of town and she just gives away a ton of food and money and water and jewels. And Miki went with her and was sort of illuminated to philanthropy Mm -hmm. with Josephine. And these two become like sisters. They both independently describe their relationship as like sisters. And Miki is the daughter of the founder of the Mitsubishi industrial empire. So he obviously knows some shit. Yeah. And Apti asks Josephine, he says, I need you to take advantage of Miki. 
I need you to use her, mm. abuse your sisterhood for the sake of the war. Will you do it? And she says, fuck yeah. And she does. And the information yeah. that she's able to get to the allies, specifically FDR, it's hard to track direct lines, but at the very least, they were aware of a situation yeah. of which they would have been ignorant without her intervention. Okay. And you can't be mad at her betraying the sisterhood for the sake of um, the allies. You know, you can't be mad at that. A word. Right? <laughs> so what that brings us now, right, to May of 1940. Which is okay. where we started. Our story started with the fuck all this shit. We were trying to figure out when it's going to start, if it's going to start, how bad it's going to be. And the Nazis came into France, Katie, so fucking fast. And they really kind of thought that they could have protected their border. They didn't know how hard and how fast they were going to come in. She gets herself to that chateau. She's got all of her fucking weird stuff spies and animals and Jewish refugees and guns and jewels and documents. Oh, and God. get this, Jock Apti, after about a week, he manages to make it there. He got out of the smoldering, you know, ruins oh. of Paris just in time. And he's like, holy shit, here we are. Yeah. So as we are going to leave it before our break, on the one hand, fucking Nazis are in France. That's bad. Bad. But she's in her castle with her new fuck toy. And they don't technically have anything to do at the moment because all of the every spy things have all been shut down. The Deuxième Bureau has been closed and on fire and everything is in fucking... Room. I mean, this is why there were so many quarantine babies. There wasn't <laughs> much else to do. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and this, my friend Katie, uh, is where we're going to leave it for the break. Okay. We'll be right back. This podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. What do you get when you take two childhood friends with a passion for unexplored history and a whole lot of booze? You get us, Queen's Podcast. And here at Queen's, we are spilling the tea on all kinds of women from history. From New Orleans voodoo queen, Marie Laveau, to Marie Antoinette, and everything in between. Each queen is paired with a cocktail recipe that will totally get you in the mood to hear the fun, dramatic, and juicy stories of fascinating women from history. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Cheers. <laughs> Before we continue to unbutton Josephine's trench coat, a nod to my crew of the extraordinarily ungentle man. <laughs> my patrons Hilf is a one woman operation and that's why you get jokes like that <laughs> and with the support from listeners like you I can keep the books coming and the buzz going while I read the latest not so secret agents to join us are Joe P Andrew J Becca B and Danita M in addition to their gob-smacking sex appeal, my patrons enjoy early access to new episodes and bonus content in the weeks in between. Oh, want in? Check out What's What at patreon.com slash podcast. Then head over to Instagram and... Are, hey, ah. we have we are rejoining our our friends Josephine and Jacques, who have, as as Katie has said, hunkered down slash funkered down in their castle. Hey, hey, when there's <sighs> nothing else to do, they don't got it's a whole true. lot else going on. They're just staying in place. Yeah, and hey, she has she owned a bed in that chateau. That was previously owned by Marie Antoinette, by the way. Because um, some people give head Isn't and it? some people get head. Am I right? Um, some people lose head. Yeah. Be like, <laughs> this is. The <laughs> um, so our and this as much as they're fucking. And I have no doubt that there is some primo fucking going on. There's also a lot yeah. of questions swirling, of course, in the Chateau Milan. And the biggest question on the minds of both Josephine and her fuck buddy slash spy colleague Jacques Abte is what the fuck? 
happened to the Dizium Bureau, right? Because right. in addition to them being our friends and colleagues, is our names are written down in there somewhere. Now we're pretty good spies. We like to, we code things and we whatever. But the fact is we don't know from where we are if they know who we are and the extent to which we're involved. And Apti has a hunch they already kind of know him because he had a visit and he's gotten his wife, what, and his kids, what, what, out and hidden, okay? And so they're, they are at this early part of 1940, hey, just kind of seeing. When the wife's away, the mice will have sex in Marie Antoinette's old bed in a chateau. That poetry. Oh, as the, snap, as the snap, famous snap, saying snap, goes. Snap, snap, yes. snap, snap. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> exactly. It's beautiful. And and the other huge question on their minds is similar, related. How do we regain contact with our spies at the SIS, with our English mm-hmm. colleagues, our British colleagues? Because at the moment, it kind of feels like England's going to be invaded next. And it's probably right around the corner. So how are they doing? And what do they know? Okay. But the thing is, Katie, oh, they do know as they are out there in the middle of the chateau they do know that the good guys are out there and the reason they know that is because of this incredible speech that Charles de Gaulle has given mm. from London just as Paris fell so Charles de Gaulle is a World War 1 hero he had been mm. on the front lines fucking fight these Nazis with everything he had and everybody loves him. And then at the very last minute, he's able to escape and he gets to England and he's like, oh, oh. And, he, Charles, and he gets to Churchill and Churchill's like, that sucked. I'm so glad you're not dead. And he's like, I need to talk to France because the first thing that happened when France fell is negotiation with the powers that be. And this guy, Petien, is French and he's like, I'll speak for France. And the Nazis and Petien have an a friendly understanding. And if you've ever heard of the term Vichy France, that's Vichy France. It's the client state of Nazi Germany. It's the occupied okay. government. So they're French and they, many of them used to be the governors when it was free France. Now they're on a German leash. Some of them are going to be into it, right? I don't know if you heard my Coco Chanel episode, but there's plenty of people in France who are like, fuck these Jews. We love Nazis. This is even better for yeah. us, right? And and there are some that are like, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this, but I've got to survive, so I'm going to go along. And there's all this spectrum yeah. of things, right? But Charles yeah. de Gaulle is nowhere on that spectrum. Charles de Gaulle is like, fuck these fucking Nazis. And when Winston Churchill gives him a microphone in London and says, go ahead and speak on the radio to the people of France, because guess what? They're going to shut the radios off any fucking second. So like, you should probably do it as soon as you can. <laughs> do it as soon as you, as you can. Like, they got, they're all ears and you probably got like any minute, right? And Charles de Gaulle gives this speech, Katie. Oh. Nous permettra d'avoir la victoire et de délivrer la patrie. And he says essentially, never give up. If you can hear my voice and get, you hide shit, save shit, shoot shit, come to me, rise up, never quit. We're not alone. It's not over. Fight, fight, fight. Joseph and this is why they're going to name an airport after me. <laughs> Mic drop. And one day you will be delayed, <laughs> at Charles de Gaulle. <laughs> and you will think of me and you never give up. Your plane will arrive. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and Josephine is in her chateau with Apti and they get goosebumps, girl. They are up. They are pounding yeah. the tables and they are like, viva la motherfucking and France. Maybe pounding something else. Girl. And, and yeah, pound. Talking about like, sex. Yeah. Abdi, you get up to <laughs> that bed, you ugly slut. <laughs> and they're doing Okay, now, if you remember, we started with the story of this sweaty kid with a briefcase. Yes, okay? yes. This sweaty kid with a briefcase is answering Charles de Gaulle's call. As is Josephine. As was Father Dillard. As is Abdi. We're all out here, girl. We are just stitching together what we can and just trying to float with hope that there might be Mm -hmm. a hand. I'm going to reach up and just keep waving my hand around until someone grabs it. And then, right, I'm going to film. Yeah. The documents, the documents that he has in that briefcase, Katie. 
that thank God didn't get confiscated. That he threw under a table, exactly, is from Vichy France. So somewhere within Vichy France, this, this Nazi-occupied France, there's some glorious soul who took these critical documents talking about the movements and locations and power of the enemy and got it into this kid's hands. They don't know where it's going to go. They don't know who to give it to, but they have to copy that information and get it back to this guy so it's not missed. So we're on a time crunch here because if we lose this contact, we're going to lose everything and then they're going to know all this information mm -hmm. is gone, which renders it useless. So Apti and Josephine copy down all of the information this kid has and then he goes back to by put it back. By hand. By hand. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Because now we're so, like, we are so used to just be like, snap it on my phone. You know, mm, being mm. a spy. Do you think being a spy now is easier or harder than it was in the 1940s? Harder because it's probably easier to leak information. Mm. I think it's or easier yeah. because of the tools. Or do you think maybe being a spy is always hard? I think it's I think it's one of those push me, pull you, yin yang things, man. Because on the one hand, you think about the fact that it was revolutionary. No one had even considered the idea that a famous person could be a spy. Yeah. And now we live in a world where you'd suspect everybody. Nobody would be safe. So on the one hand, it'd be easier, but you know. But now we have cameras. You don't have to handwrite everything. So, you know, yeah, I don't Equals. know. Equals. It sucks. I think it sucks and it's hot. <laughs> no, hopefully you're getting fucked no matter what by some. It sucks and it's hot. <laughs> it sucks and it's always hot. That's what we know for sure. <laughs> so now they're sitting there, though. They've got all this sensitive information. They know they don't have a ton of time with it. And they and as I said, there are only two big questions. We're like, where are all the French spies? Where are all the English spies? How the fuck do we get in touch with any of our spy friends? And they're like, tick, tick. And as fate, luck, you can name it, what happened? They get another, a, a knock on the door, and it's a postcard. Hey, a postcard has arrived for you. And it simply says, it's from Lisbon, Portugal, which is a neutral mm -hmm. nation in the war. And it okay. says simply, come, lots of sunshine here. And Jacques Apte starts to hop around the goddamn chateau like his ass is on fire. He's clapping, he's singing, <laughs> he's like, woohoo, God, that's sunshine! sunshine! And Portugal. Josephine's like, yay, I love postcards, but you seem so super happy about it's this one. It's so giant. What is uh -huh. the big deal? And he tells her, so you know how I made my way here? Because it wasn't like he mm. arrived there overnight. Like they didn't go there together. He found his way there through the rubble of like the invasion. And he's like, mm. on my way here, I happened to run into my old friend Hans Musig. And Hans Musig, Katie, get your panties ready for this guy. He oh, is oh, oh, oh. German. He was yes, rich. as I gathered from the name Hans. Hans. Yeah, 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 yeah. He is from a very rich and wealthy family and had mm. been a very enthusiastic member of the Hitler Youth. Until mm. he until, realized. I like that. What the fuck the Hitler Youth was, right? <laughs> but Katie, he doesn't just leave the Hitler Youth. Okay. He fucking steals every penny from the bank account of his local <laughs> Hitler Youth. And he Good goes immediately him. to England and is and starts to originally just kind of live. He's he's not exactly trying to like save anybody he's just like i'm out hard out and when he starts to get caught by english and french people for just like having bad passports and the shape and being german and sneaky and having money for no reason they think he's a spy and when they finally yeah. catch up with him it is jacques apte's job to sort of light torture him <laughs> like they don't <laughs> His job, they say in the book that it was Jacques, in the book they quote it as his job to see into his heart, which I think there's a lot of ways to get. And he ultimately, Jacques Apte is oh, the one. Torture. Right. Who's like, no, this guy Hans Musig is, is for real anti-Nazi. And we are so yeah. fucking lucky to get this guy because he's native German. He speaks perfectly. He's going to be able to get in and out of places we can't. And they recruit him. So flash forward, Paris falls and Jacques Apte and Hans Musig see each other and are like, <gasps> my buddy, 
Man. Thing. And they sit down together and they talk like, what the fuck are we going to do? And, and Jacques's like, well, I'm going to Josephine's house. And he's like, that's a good idea. And he's like, I am. Hans says, I think my best bet is to go to Lisbon because they're neutral right now. And Portugal and England have been super tight buddies since the Crusades. And there's a English uh, British embassy there in Lisbon that I bet I could get into. And if I can get to the English in Lisbon, I might just be able to reconnect the SIS with the Free France former Duzian yeah. Bureau, therefore creating an incredibly important connection. And he's like, or I'll die. Yes. I don't know. But listen, if <laughs> I don't, I'll send a postcard to Josephine's yeah. house. And I'll say, come, lots of sunshine here. So we've got our buddy Jacques, who just got this dump of important documents, uh, who literally yes. didn't know what to do with them. And in the other hand, he just got Hans's fucking postcard. And now yes. he's like, oh, let's see. Now I need an excuse to get to Lisbon. Hmm. Who do we know? Who's internationally know? famous, has got perfect mm. tits, has an open invitation to mm. any fucking place she wants to go. Right. Mm. So not only, Katie, does Josephine set up a tour to go to Lisbon and perform, but Jacques <gasps> gets to pretend to be her tour secretary. <laughs> oh, perfect. What a perfect cover until someone's like, until someone's like, hey, can I see a schedule or something? And he's like, why the fuck are you asking me? Yeah. Is that what I do? Is that what secretaries that what I, oh, do? Okay. And I mean, and the sec, I mean, the fucking had to just get better. Cause I mean, yeah. Can you- <laughs> Oh, yeah. And now they're, cause, yeah, because now they're spies on the move in new places. Ugh, now they've they just get been, to fuck on trains. Yes. They've just been sexy spies at the, her home with Marie Antoinette's bed, but now they're like, it's even more dangerous. On the road. They're on the road. And, it's, and they're going to want to fuck because there's lots of things to like, you know, when it's trauma fucking and you're just trying to like get horrible <laughs> images oh out of God. your brain. These train stations are full of refugees, man. We've oh. got our sad and broken people who are huddling together. And Josephine has to still move among them as if she is just rich and famous and on her way to a tour. Maybe she'll throw some food and throw some diamonds, but it's like... They have to sort of insulate themselves from the real yeah. horror that is increasingly becoming like visible, right? And this Ugh. is one part of the spy stuff. I'm just going to kind of briefly tell you, it's a crazy, wonderful, buy this book, read every page, it's fucking nuts. But in short, sister gets to Lisbon, mm -hmm. Hans gets into the embassy, and they are able to establish, and this is directly because of Josephine Baker, Katie, they are able to establish a pipeline of information that runs directly from the French resistance to the United Kingdom, to Winston Churchill. There had not been, prior to this, any way for these entities to communicate, and everybody was fucking desperate to get information to and from these places that was accurate and secret. And so this pipeline goes from Marseille to Casablanca, which is in Morocco, to Lisbon, mm -hmm. and then to Britain. And be, to keep that flow of information going, Josephine Baker just needs to keep performing in all of these hot, fucking sexy places. And this is where the stuff we know, pinning notes in her panties. She's got invisible ink written in between the, the, the sheet music. She's got trunks. And this is the other thing, girl, she'd pull up to this thing and they'd be like, of course they're going to look through her stuff, but like Beyonce and like Taylor Swift, they're not strip searching her. No. Cause it would be in the newspapers if fucking Josephine Baker got strip search she would throw a fit and she's been invited and she's been invited she's been invited mm -mm. by the royal mm -mm. family by the rich and powerful fans they wouldn't stand for it how dare you treat her like that right oh. and in the midst of this all this this pipeline that she's established at some point through that pipeline there comes a piece of information that is her name <gasps> which means Probably should just get out of France for real, though. And like, let's mm -hmm, just not go mm -hmm. back to France for a minute. Mm, but that's fine. We have a great excuse. And she goes, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go spend some time in Casablanca. Oh. Mm. <laughs> you 
must remember this. Let me reach through the screen and take hold of both of your nipples, okay? And I'm going to tweak them. This is my history nerd tweaking your movie nerd because the movie Casablanca is a fabulous artifact. Like if you really want to get tits deep into this stuff, like I suggest you get a cocktail and watch Casablanca because okay. first of all, that movie came out in 1942. Okay. While everything's happening. So the yeah, movie was not a yeah. retrospective. It was like White Christmas was looking back on it. Fucking Casablanca yeah. is made, shot, and released in the fucking thick of it. Okay. And if yeah. you have seen the movie, what you undoubtedly recall is that the major plot point of Casablanca is that it's like Hotel California. It's this beautiful, classy, <laughs> there's lots of Sorry. drinks, it's Rick's nightclub, but you're trapped in Casablanca. Uh, never out of day. Morocco is a colony of France. It's North Africa, mm -hmm. belongs to France, but France right now belongs to Germany. So that means that French Morocco belongs to the France that belongs to Germany, and it's technically neutral away. So there's the, who actually runs France? So there's de Gaulle, who's like French, real French, real, it, if yeah. you're real loyal to France, then you're with us. And then there's the Vichy France, which is like, but if you're really France and under French protection and under French control, then that means that you're also a client now of the Nazis. But there's also a faction within Morocco who's wanted to get rid of these French colonizers forever because they don't love French colonizers. And they're kind yeah. of thinking like maybe the Nazis will help us get rid of our French colonizers, but the Nazis aren't exactly great to African people. And what this means is that in the city, it's tense. No one knows if anyone's anyone's friend. So you're French. What does that mean? So you're it's North African. Fuck. Does that mean, but, right? And there's booze. It's a fuck. And no one can leave. And no one can get a visa. And the people who are deciding who can come and who can go are half Nazi and half French. And everybody just wants a bribe. And as a result, you have all of these people who are just fucking stuck. Yeah. All of them, except... Josephine Baker, because she's Taylor Swift, because she's Beyonce, because she's got to go on tour. Can, and it's not just that she can come and go from Casablanca. She can bring a guy. She can hire a piano player. That's my dressmaker. She is able to get in and out of Casablanca several times when people people are willing to fight and die and give their fortune. Couldn't even think I about mean, it. I mean, when you're as famous as Josephine Baker, you could literally have somebody that's so obviously a spy and you'll be like, no, that's just um, that's the guy that I just hired to follow me around and look mysterious. Yeah. And they're like, oh, it's it's her mystery guy. Yeah, that's Philippe. Okay. He feeds my monkey. And they're like, oh, yeah. well, she does have her monkey. And by the way, she did travel with her animals, with, which made it even her, more yeah. like like you'd look at her. You'd be like, this bitch isn't sneaking anything anywhere, you know, because who look at her hiding in plain sight. Totally. Yeah. She but was invited. Then, her monkeys were invited. Her monkeys her were invited. Her mystery dude were invited. Totally. Yes. So she's got this job. She's got to go. She's get you know, more transferring all this stuff. And it's time to fly out of Casablanca and they go to the plane and then er, not Jacques. All of a sudden, without a ton of explanation, Jacques can't leave Casablanca. He's in the movie. He's one of those fucking guys in the movie, in Rick's. We don't know why. No one will explain it. His passport's no good. Maybe they know he's a spy. Maybe, nobody. She, Josephine, can't get any answers from the Vichy French or from the uh, Moroccans, she, the, the folks in Casablanca. She can't get anything from Lisbon. Nobody. No. He even risks talking directly to some of his other spies to be like, what the fuck is up? And they what, have what no idea. He is, and Ooh. he's just, and she, as a result, has to do a bunch of shit completely by herself. So she's <sighs> like, okay, bye. And there's this amazing scene, girl, where he and literally- she's been spying for a minute, but she's not been spying by herself. Yeah, like we still- She's been in partnership. Yeah, having a mentor ain't bad, right? Yeah. There's this amazing scene where he literally runs along the train as she leaves because both of them are like, is this a trap to separate us right before they interrogate us in a yeah. gulag? Right. Oh, God. Ugh. Oh, yeah. So she goes, he is now Jacques stuck in Morocco, just getting drunk. Fucking. I mean, it could be worse. Yeah. I call this section Morocco Mo problems. Because 
Yes. My rock on my problems. <gasps> Girl, picture our guy, hot Jacques Abde. He's sad. He feels probably a little emasculated. Josephine's out there, right, alone in Lisbon, and he can't even get a passport. And then he meets the 12 apostles. And, like, I do think there's a reason why history is dominated by World War II. I think there's a reason why history is dominated by spy shit, and it's because it's so fun. It's interesting, and it's hot. I mean... World War II wasn't hot, but it's just like, it's got the perfect villain. And it's mm. got the, it's, we love a story that has a clear bad guy. Word. And that Hitler and, is not an ambiguous dude. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Not even a little. You're like, he's a failed painter. You're like, yeah, okay. Uh, you know what? Lots of people failed at stuff. They didn't do a genocide. You know, exactly. Exactly. Um, And and this part of the history, especially when you don't know the ending, which is always the frustrating part about being in the present, (laughs) (laughs) is that the U.S. at this point in the war is like, not it. Okay, girl, we did not like World War One. That was no fun. We just got through the Great Depression. We just did this. We just did this. this. Also, we are so far away. You cunts are all touching. You know what I mean? Yeah. England touches France, touches Germany. And so you fucks got to work it out like kids in the backseat. We are way over here. We'll we don't send care. You some, we'll send you some weapons. Good luck yeah. and all. But um, also, yeah, we're not great racially. We're not terrific with our racial divisions either. Call us when it's over. Right. Yeah. And yet and yet and yet. The world is always aligning. Everyone's finding teams. And FDR, by this time, personally, is actually very eager to get involved in World War II. And the allies in Europe are like, pretty much we'll win. We won't win if you don't join. We will win if you do. So you are now our ace in the hole. But for a million of complicated reasons, including the American public and the greater stage, FDR cannot seem or say or articulate Boy, I'd sure like to get in that war, everybody. What do you think, right? So these Until 12... someone gives them a good reason. Word. But in the meantime, be- which as we know, spoiler alert, that's Pearl Harbor Day. Mm-hmm. We are at the moment you and I are talking. We're about six months away from that. Okay? okay. And these guys arrive in Morocco. Twelve Americans known as the Twelve Apostles. Ostensibly... They are there because the United States has agreed to simply send a bunch of aid, food, water, supplies that are meant to help civilians. And these 12 guys have been sent by the U.S. government to simply monitor the aid that we have supplied to North Africa to ensure that that aid that we've supplied to North Africa is not being used for any military purposes. Because, okay. as you know, we're not involved militarily. Got but it. what's actually happening is these 12 guys have been sent there specifically to fuck shit up. We want you 12 <laughs> guys. Right? Fuck our aid. The aid has been thrown into a meat grinder. We have no idea what's going to happen with that aid. But you 12 guys, Secret you're in Morocco. Secret agents of chaos. You are hot. You are young. You are inexperienced. It is perfect. And the Germans, by all accounts, were fully aware that these 12 guys were there as spies. And they would make fun of them. Like, <laughs> the information that we were getting from them is they were like, what a bunch of children. Look at these nerds. They weren't scared of these 12 guys at all. Okay. And what they don't know is that these 12 guys have gotten in Jacques, uh, have gotten in touch with Jacques, who's just getting <gasps> drunk by himself. And Jacques is the guy. Yeah. And Jacques is like, fuck yes. C- c- totally. And crazy again. Don't have time for the whole thing. But the bottom line is they set up in the illegal cigarette smuggling operation with the mafia, the U.S. mafia and the French mafia, So that they can be self-funding, because one of the ways that you spot a spy is who's given them money. So they paid for themselves by running illegal cigarettes, but they were working within those cigarettes. They're also smuggling radios and secret agents. It's fucking great. It's the best intrigue. And Josephine is running this stuff and she's hiding these guys. And some of these apostles are running her around town. And it's goddamn great. Now, I'm sure that you will agree with me that... As you are surrounded by cheetahs, monkeys, spies, 
and Nazis Mm -hmm. on the road in a foreign country in the middle of a world war that it's the best possible time to have a baby. You know. (laughs) And Josephine goes to a doctor. I'd really, really like to have a baby. And the doctor was like, an abortion. Got it. I'll come and write. Wait, what? And she's like, no, 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 no. No, I don't want an abortion. I know that's what everybody's coming for. I want to have a baby. And he's like, no. On purpose. And she goes, no, for real. And he's like, why would you want? He literally is like, right now, this is a terrible (laughs) time to have a baby. And she goes, no, it's not. It's the best time to have a baby. When better to start a new life and to increase the number of hopeful, optimistic people on earth than in the middle of a war. And he's like, well, that's fucking crazy, but all right. And she says, I just, I, and she at this point has had some miscarriages. She's never okay. been able to get pregnant. She's wanted to. So what he does is he, he gives her an x-ray uh, to check. And to get that x-ray, you have to have this little injection. They give you like a, an injection of fluid so that your x-ray appears. So your insides glow. Yeah. And the x-ray reveals she's good. You can totally have a baby if you choose to. There's no real reason I can see why you can't. And she rides home from the hospital, Katie, on cloud nine fucking, I can have a baby. And she's kind of thinking, man. And when she gets home, uh, one of the 12 apostles is there with Jacques and she's in this great mood. But then as the sun goes down later that evening, she starts to get kind of feverish and sick. And by the end of the night... She went from cloud nine, I think I could have a baby, to like, am I fucking dying, man? She is sick, really sick. This illness lasts over a year. This bitch is feverish and on death's door at least five times over the course of a year. I thought this was a miscarriage. In my research, her time where she was sick for like 18 months. I thought that was a miscarriage. She had a complicated miscarriage earlier in her life. This mm. was actually a result of the injection she got for the that making x-ray. your insides glow for the x-ray. Yeah. I recall when I listened to your podcast, you mentioned this period of time in which she's sick for yeah. over a year and it was something of a mystery. And it was in part because even the folks who later knew that she was a spy thought that she was faking to some extent at least the duration of the illness because her hospital room became actually a really convenient place to do spy shit. She was able yeah. to see people could come and visit her without having to explain why they were coming to visit her. The The hospital totally. was very secure. And so while there did appear to be a silver lining, she was actually on death's door and that infection yeah. kept coming back again and again and again. Ugh. And she's in this hospital room and Jacques is with her. He takes good care of her. He, he uh, uh, takes her in an emergency rides. I mean, th- this guy is, is a true friend, even if it is a matter of sort of <laughs> professional convenience. Right. Yeah. And it is from this deathbed, this, this at times just like right. Worst case scenario, hotel room that they continue to contribute the intelligence necessary for what's called Operation Torch. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Operation Torch before? I don't remember coming across this at all in my research. Oh, so Operation Torch is, in a way, the precursor to D-Day and the Normandy landing. It's the first amphibious landing. So one of the things that Josephine Baker had done that was so critical to the spying, and, and this one really breaks my heart, is that she was really good friends with a lot of sultans and Mm -hmm. high-powered political figures and oligarchs within North Africa and French Morocco Mm -hmm. and that general area. Yeah, she had an affair with one of them. Oh, fuck yeah. Please, who wouldn't, you know? (laughs) And and one of the things that these guys are having a hard time navigating for themselves is what's going to be better, to remain a colonized country to, to, to succumb Mm -hmm. to our French colonizers or to Mm -hmm. let the Nazis roll in. And she, despite the way that she was treated in the United States, despite her firsthand experience in the United States, tells these factions, you can count on the U S I assure you they will get involved. And when they do, they will bring victory. My people will stand on the side of the allies. They will show up and they will do everything possible. Yeah. I just sometimes think about as she thinks she might be dying, 
a country she rejected fighting for the her heroism of her yeah. home country. It's just such a beautiful thing, right? She was just so deep in her convictions that, you know, and she believed that France also, you know, would end up siding with the U.S., that they would all come together. She was, oh, she just had the foresight, you know? Right. And this area, sister, of North Africa is super critical to the war because it's like, it's a port city. Mm -hmm. I've already explained to you how it's French, good French, bad French. We don't know. (laughs) When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor... In nineteen in December of nineteen forty one, mm-hmm. and the United States officially gets involved in World War II. Jacques Abdi runs into her hotel room to tell her the news, and she almost flatlines. Oh my it's god! It's such a shock to her. <gasps> it is such a shock to her heart that she almost dies. And when she comes to, she's so fucking excited. And what's going to happen now is the allies, including the United States, are using the intelligence that Josephine Baker herself actively got to successfully land in North Africa. That's Operation Torch, man. The Ah. allies absolutely need North Africa, they need it. They absolutely need it. There's no way they can win without it. Hitler seemed to have overlooked the importance of North Africa. Vichy France is still going to fight. They technically have to fight against the allies, whoever's going to invade. But how much are they going to fight? Is the intelligence that Josephine and the 12 apostles were getting, how hard are the French going to fight against you if you invade? Right. Right. They were also getting intelligence about the French resistance within North Africa. How many of the French people here will actively fight for you and on your side? And what are those sultans going to do? Are they going to fight for you or against you? And without knowing those critical pieces of information and without that information being correct, there would have been no way for Operation Torch to have been a success. And it was. Because Josephine was like, I know my people. I wonder if a little bit... I wonder if she had a touch of the second sight a little bit. Do you know what I mean? I like. I wonder if she I was there so. with like some a tarot deck or something, mm. an oracle deck, mm. being like, "No, mm. I see this. She's manifesting." I wonder. I wonder. I hope so. I like that. But picture this scene okay. straight out of the book. Okay. okay. Josephine and Jacques are standing on the balcony of her hospital room when the leaflets start to fall. <sighs> These pieces of paper and the power goes out and these leaflets fall. One lands on her balcony. She picks it up. It's a picture of FDR and it's saying people of France, we're fucking coming. We're coming in and we'd really appreciate it. If you wouldn't fight, we're here to liberate you. The Nazis are bad. Viva la France, right? Yeah. She is still too sick to leave her hotel room, but she hunkers down and Jacques is running around like, how can I help? How can I help? And they're trying to figure out maybe they can get her in an ambulance and pretend that they are taking uh, an ambulance, but they can actually go to the front lines and tell Patton, yeah, General Patton, uh-huh. who's in North Africa, what they know because they have even more information than they were able to, you know, they have up to the minute information. Yeah. So they are like, how do we, and we're in a hospital, right? Okay, how do we use the hospital? How do we use that? And Josephine's like, I can't get in the ambulance. But Jacques's like, but I can fucking drive the ambulance. Jacques gets in an ambulance, <laughs> bombs, leaflets, crazy. <gasps> he drives to the front lines to get Patton some critical information that he knows about the city of Casablanca. And sister, Josephine's information was correct. The sultans and the free French rise up. The leaflets fall on November 8th. On November 11th, the French surrender. And we are cooking our way to victory, girl. Yes. Holy fuck. How is this not a movie? How is this not a movie? I mean, Casablanca is a great start, but fuck. The Joseph. Like that last scene, that last scene, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship OK, and and the whole thing that the fucking leaflets in real history fall like three days later. It's nuts. Josephine and Casablanca. How is that not a movie? Maybe we'll make it. Maybe we'll make it. Maybe we'll make it. <laughs> and when victory is declared, right, we have beaten back the Nazis. We have fought and won against the forces of tyranny in this world. She goes back to New York City for the first time and they won't 
serve her a fucking meal. Mother fucker. Do you know what I've fucking done for you bitches? Mm. Mm. She goes, I mean, you know, you tell beautifully the story where she's at the, the stork and she, they won't serve her and she's sitting there and Grace Kelly, mm. princess of Monaco, takes her by the hand and is like, Let's get the fuck, fuck these fucks. She was like, I hear Let's this steak here out. tastes like shit. And they leave together hand in hand. <laughs> That's right. Mm. Let's go show each other our tits yes. somewhere else. Yes. Uh, and um, and that, my, my friend Katie, that is the conclusion <sighs> of the Josephine Baker spy years. And I have gone on and on. I gasped for breath. Yeah. I waved my arms. And you know I didn't tell it all, girl. No, there's... You know that you still... That wasn't 400 pages of book, girl. That was just the highlight. Josephine Baker, the the spy who shagged plenty. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks again to Katie Hearn Church. And if you haven't already, go and find her and Nathan on the Queen's podcast. They are available wherever you listen. And every episode is a banger. As for Josephine, man, I told you her life was full and dense. I mean, we just saw a small keyhole view into her staggeringly fascinating life. Like, do you want to hear more about her childhood in St. Louis when she worked as a domestic servant? Do you want to hear about when she came back to the U.S. in the 1960s and introduced Martin Luther King Jr. at the Million Man March. What? Do you want to hear about her 12 adopted kids she called the Rainbow Tribe that she raised with her gay husband? (laughs) I know. Okay, so you got choices. You could get this book and read all 500 fucking, but you're not going to do that. You could go find that two-parter Katie and Nathan did on their podcast. That's so good. And you can sign up right now. To be a Patreon subscriber, and I'll tell you it all in my way in a bonus episode. <laughs> Hot, right? Find us at patreon.com slash podcast or click the link in our show description. In the meantime, our next new episode features another bad bitch, Amelia Earhart. I'll take you along from the first time she spotted a plane to her last tragic moments. Until then... Our theme song was composed and performed by Kat Perkins. A reminder that you can find my sources, links to the books, documentaries, and articles I reference in the summary of this episode or by emailing us, hilfpodcast at gmail.com or messaging us on social media at hilfpodcast. This has been Hilf. History I'd like to fuck with Don Brody. I'm Don Brody, reminding you that history is a party. And everybody's coming. <laughs> Fuck.